The Unconscious Civilization by John Ralston Saul. Chapter 1 The Great Leap Backwards. Who is more contemptible than he who scorns knowledge of himself? A true question, a question seeking truth without expecting to find more than a fragment of it, will remain clear and unforgiving over hundreds of years. John of Salisbury raised this problem of self knowledge in 1159. As you will see, much of what I'm going to say in these pages will be an amplification of his question. John of Salisbury was far from the first to center the life worth living on self-knowledge, what today we would call consciousness. Self-knowledge, the life worth living, individualism, humanism, a civil society, the list of terms describing the best and most interesting in the human experiment can be very long. Not only was John of Salisbury not the first, he was surrounded in the 12th century by a surprisingly large group of writers and thinkers spread out across Europe, many of them monks or teachers, who were busy rediscovering the concept of the individual, perhaps even discovering for the first time what the modern Western individual could become if he, and later on she, wished. Nowhere in all of this questioning, then or before, was the individual seen as a single ambulatory centre of selfishness. That idea of individualism dominant today, represents a narrow and superficial deformation of the Western idea, a hijacking of the term and, since individualism is a central term, a hijacking of Western civilization. One of the things I'm going to do over these five chapters is describe that hijacking. The end result will be the portrait of a society addicted to ideologies, a civilization tightly held at this moment in the embrace of a dominant ideology, corporatism. The acceptance of corporatism causes us to deny and undermine the legitimacy of the individual as citizen in a democracy. The result of such a denial is a growing imbalance which leads to our adoration of self-interest and our denial of the public good. Corporatism is an ideology which claims rationality as its central quality. The overall effects on the individual are passivity and conformity in those areas which matter and non-conformism in those which don't. Given the importance that John of Salisbury attributed to friendship and community, it is hard to imagine that he would not have asked the same question of society as a whole, particularly of ours, which is so determined to claim the individual as its anchor. What is more contemptible than a civilization that scorns knowledge of itself? I'll be more precise. It is taught throughout our universities, expounded in our think tanks, repeated ad nauseum in public forums by responsible figures, the democracy was born of economics, in particular of an economic phenomenon known as the Industrial Revolution. And that democracy is based upon individualism, and that modern individualism was also a child of the Industrial Revolution. The less determinedly superficial of such voices will give some credit to the Reformation, which makes them only marginally less inaccurate. The point of these received wisdoms of the second half of the 20th century is that the very heart and soul of our 2,500 year old civilization is, apparently, economics. And from that heart flowed and continues to flow everything else. We must therefore fling down and fling up the structures of our society as the marketplace orders. If we don't, the marketplace will do it anyway. The only problem with this whole theory is that much of modern individualism and democracy found life in Athens sometime before the Industrial Revolution, and both grew slowly with ups and downs through a series of key steps until the 12th century, when the pace accelerated. Every important characteristic of both individualism and democracy has preceded the key economic events of our millennium. What's more, it was these characteristics that made most of the economic events possible, and not vice versa. I'm going to come back to all of that later, but let me make one general point before moving on. Economics as a prescriptive science is actually a minor area of speculative investigation. Econometrics, the statistical, narrow, unthinking, lower form of economics, is passive tinkering, less reliable and less useful than car mechanics. The only part of this domain which has some reliable utility is economic history, and it is being downgraded in most universities, even eliminated because, tied as it is to events, it is an unfortunate reminder of reality. Over the last quarter century, economics has raised itself to the level of a scientific profession and more or less foisted a Nobel Prize in its own honour onto the Nobel Committee thanks to annual financing from a bank. Yet over the same 25 years, 
economics has been spectacularly unsuccessful in its attempts to apply its models and theories to the reality of our civilization. It's not that the economist's advice hasn't been taken. It has, in great detail, with great reverence. And in general, it has failed. A profession implies both real parameters and professionals who bear some responsibility for the effects of their advice. If economists were doctors, they would today be mired in malpractice suits. Did I even have to make this argument about the subsidiary nature of economics as it relates to individualism and democracy, and I'll come back to it later on to flesh out details, suggests that we are a dangerously unconscious civilization. Not only do we seem to be devoid of useful memory, but when we do remember accurately, it has little or no impact on our actions. It is as if, when we come to public action, our greatest desire is to generalize and institutionalize a syndrome resembling Alzheimer's disease. One third to one half of the population of Western countries is today employed in administering the public and private sectors. In spite of having a larger and better educated elite than ever before in history, in spite of knowing more than we have ever known about ourselves and our surroundings, we actively deny the utility of public knowledge. In the 19th century, Alessandro Menzoni opened his great novel, The Betrothed, with one of those unforgiving resumes of our condition. History may truly be defined as a famous war against time, but you cannot wage this war if you deny reality. If you cannot remember, then there is no reality. To know, that is, to have knowledge, is to instinctively understand the relationship between what you know and what you do. That seems to be one of our biggest difficulties. Our actions are only related to tiny, narrow bands of specialist information, usually based on a false idea of measurement rather than upon any knowledge, that is, understanding, of the larger picture. The result is that where a knowing woman or man would embrace doubt and advance carefully, our enormous, specialized, technocratic elites are shielded by a childlike certainty. Whatever they are selling is the absolute truth. Why link childishness to certainty? Quite simply, as Cicero put it, he who does not know history is destined to remain a child. There is little character difference between, say, Robert McNamara, maniacally convinced that the Vietnam War would, could, must be won, or catastrophe would descend upon us, and he had the numbers to prove it, and the thousands of financial specialists maniacally convinced today that national debts will, can, must be paid off or catastrophe will swoop down upon us, and they have the numbers to prove it. Let me give a small demonstration of this childlike state into which we are settling. There is a general sense that our civilization is in a long-term crisis. It can be seen from the political or social or economic aspect. From each angle, the same crisis can be seen differently. I would argue that it took on its actual economic form in 1973 when a first wave of political crises led to an oil supply crisis. We've been in a depression ever since. It doesn't resemble a 1929-style depression, but then depressions have always been different one from the other. Ours has been softened and evened out thanks to the life preservers gradually put in place by society after 1929 in order to give us time to manoeuvre and act should such a disaster repeat itself. It did in 1973. Now, given our inability over the past two decades to deal with an unbreakable chain of unemployment, debt, inflation and no real growth, we have drifted farther and farther out into a cold, unfriendly, confusing sea. The new certitude of those in positions of authority, those out of the water, is that the certain answer is to cut away the life preservers. This might be called a childlike act, or one of unconsciousness so profound as to constitute stupidity. How is this certitude possible? Well, the view from inside the public and private technocracy is one of relative calm. This is a place where the structure continues to grow, particularly in the private sector particularly in the internationalized private sector. The technocracy has developed an argument that now dominates our society according to which management equals doing, in the sense that doing equals making. They have based this argument on a new economic mythology. This in turn is dependent on such things as the glorification of the service economy, a legitimization of financial speculation, and the canonization of the new communications technology. But of course, managing is neither doing nor making. As Adam Smith put it, there is one sort of labor which adds to the value of the subject upon which it is bestowed. There is another which has no such effect. 
The former is productive, the latter unproductive labour. Smith clearly places management in the unproductive category. The labour of some of the most respectable orders in the society is, like that of menial servants, unproductive of any value and does not fix or realise itself in any permanent subject or vendable commodity, which endures after that labour is passed and for which an equal quantity of labour could afterwards be procured. Smith, of course, is realistic, but there is no country in which the whole annual produce is employed in maintaining the industrious. The idle everywhere consume a great part of it. His argument is that the industrious produce the fund which finances the whole community. The idle, those not engaged in useful labour, live upon the industrious. This includes the unwillingly idle, the unemployed, but he is not talking about them. They are not in a position to cost society a great deal. He is referring above all to the managerial class of his day, the aristocracy, the courtiers, the professionals, the land and property owners who live off rent income, the bankers and so on. In other words, he is talking about our technocratic managerial elite. It must exist. But how much of it can the industrious among us support? The answer might be that 30% to 50%, the current level of the managerial class in our society, is far too high that the management of business along with the financial and consulting industries, all of which are extremely expensive and increasingly so, are a far more important factor in keeping the economy in depression than is any overexpansion of government services. Some of you will be surprised that I am invoking Adam Smith, the god of marketplace worshippers and of the neoconservatives. Well, I'm going to make a point of quoting both Smith and his friend David Hume, the demigod of the same contemporary right, for two reasons. One is to show that the reigning ideologues of our day base their arguments upon a very narrow use of Smith and Hume, that they seriously misrepresent the more balanced messages of the two men, and that the late industrial, global applications of Smith and Hume, which are now being pressed upon us, bear no relationship to the reality of what either man was talking about in an almost pre-industrial and very localised situation. Many are surprised that this management elite continues to expand and prosper at a time when society as a whole is clearly blocked by a long-term economic crisis. There is no reason to be surprised. The reaction of sophisticated elites when confronted by their own failure to lead society is almost invariably the same. They set about building a wall between themselves and reality by creating an artificial sense of well-being on the inside. The French aristocracy, gentry and business leadership were never more satisfied with themselves than in the few decades before their collapse during the French Revolution. The elites of the late Roman Empire were in constant expansion and filled with a sense of their own importance as emperor after emperor was assassinated and the provinces were lost. The Russian elites of the two decades preceding 1914, both the traditional leadership and the new rapidly expanding business class, were in a constant state of effervescence. One of the tricks which makes this sort of closet delusion possible is that the very size and prosperity of the elite permits it to interiorize an artificial vision of civilization as a whole. Thus, ours takes seriously only what comes from its own hundreds, indeed thousands, of specialized sectors. Everything turns on internal reference. Everything is carefully measured so that heartening body counts of growth or job creation or whatever can be produced. Truth is not in the world. It is the measurements made by professionals. A few weeks ago, I had a long conversation with the Deputy Minister of Finance of a Western country. He allowed as to how many people outside, by which he meant outside the elite, believed that we were all caught up in a general uncontrollable crisis, and that many attributed some of the blame to the international money markets, which were seen to have declined, through lunatic expansion, into a purposeless myriad of speculations upon repeated levels of paper unrelated to real production, unrelated, that is, to Smith's useful labour. The problem, the Deputy Minister said, was that each of these new money market mechanisms had its use within the financial system. Each was therefore useful, not merely an exercise in speculation. He was, however, unable to relate this financial system to any broader idea of the economy or the society. He also said that he himself had come from a poor family, that he had done well, as had his brothers and sisters. He therefore had difficulty believing that there was a crisis anywhere except at the margins of society that his family's success might be related to the life preservers put in place after 1929, those protections against drowning that he and others were now cutting away, 
or that other people not so fortunate as he and his family might still need some help staying afloat was beyond his interiorized, childlike vision of society. The statistics of our crisis, which are available to all of us, as they are to this deputy minister, are clear and unforgiving. Yet they pass us by, in newspapers, on television, in conversations, as if they were not reality, or rather, as if we were unable to convert knowledge into action. I could recite a litany of these failures to you. Let me mention only a few to illustrate the apparent meaninglessness of reality. I'll begin with basics. Murder. Those of us who follow the phenomenon of war have watched while a handful of small conflicts in the early 1960s escalated to over 50 around the world today, all of them being fought concurrently, many of them major wars. The generally agreed statistics are that some 1,000 soldiers and 5,000 civilians die per day, every day, for a total of over 2 million deaths per year, for a total of 75 million deaths over the past 35 years. The conservative English military historian John Keegan states that 50 million people have been killed by war since the peace began in 1945. Either way, these are record numbers. They make World War I into a sideshow. They make the Black Death into a small joke. In general, these deaths are not so much dismissed as eased off any serious agendas with a qualification that the wars in question take place mainly in the Third World. Whatever you think about that marginalizing qualifier, this has been less and less true since the end of the Cold War. What's more, much of the responsibility for such violence lies with the international arms traffic, the largest international trade of good of our day. It was launched in its modern form by the United States, France, and then Britain in the early 1960s. Everyone else soon joined in. First the West, then the developing world. And when the Cold War ended, the promised peace dividend evaporated. The commerce in arms carried on at more or less the same levels. Today, a theoretically liberal American president has formalized a new campaign to increase the sale of weapons abroad, specifically as an arm of general trade policy. We know all of this, but knowing seems to have no effect upon our unconscious. Then there are the astonishing third world statistics. 200 million children aged 4 to 14 are in the workforce. Life expectancy in Central Africa is 43 and dropping. One third of the children in the world are undernourished. 30% of the workforce is unemployed. The third world debt crisis is not eased. That number is now some 1.5 trillion. All of these numbers leave us confused, numbed, indifferent. This is knowledge with little effect. What about focusing on a great case for hope? Mexico, on the basis of the assurances of the American and Canadian elites to their own citizens, Mexico was thrown into an increasingly unfettered North American trade agreement. Mexico, we were told, was a developed democracy which, thanks to a reforming free market president, had cleaned up its act and was capable of competing at our standards. Scarcely two years later, that president is suspected of involvement in the assassination of his chosen successor. A civil war has broken out in the South where 80% of the population earn less than $7 a day. Government-initiated torture, routinely denied by our elites two years ago, is now routinely admitted. After a revolutionary privatization of 80% of the state firms, the results are as follows. The state earned $21 billion, which instead of stabilizing the economy, contributed to a massive economic collapse. On the positive side, some 30 billionaires were created all friends of the president or the party in power. Unfortunately, if you weren't one of those 30 or one of their friends, real wages in Mexico plunged by 52% between 1980 and 1994. With much of the collapse of 1995 still to come, one third of Mexican families were already living in extreme poverty. All of these figures are now far worse. The knowledge of this misrepresentation of the Mexican situation by our elites has had no effect on the reality of American and Canadian policy. We are proceeding as if the illusion of two years earlier had been true. And finally, what of the crisis inside the West itself? The official organization for economic cooperation and development figure for unemployment in the West is about 35 million. That is about 10%. This has not moved down seriously for a decade. This is also an unfinanceable level of exclusion for any society. In other words, no society can afford to lose the productivity of 10% of its population over an extended period of time, nor can it afford to finance the lives of 10% of the working population along with their families left idle over an extended period of time. 
This figure of 10% is also, compared with our real levels of unemployment, a very low figure. Over the past two decades, the term unemployment has been redefined constantly, between 15 and 25 times in most Western countries, technical refinements, you understand, in order to eliminate certain categories or to create new categories. The purpose has been to keep the official statistics down. Rather than 35 million, the real unemployment figure is probably well over 50 million. And although government after government from left to right has been elected on a platform of job creation, the reality is that they have no idea of what to do. Why? Because jobs are one of the last steps on the production chain. If you want jobs, you must first research, develop, plan, risk, invest, build, develop markets and start selling. The result may eventually be jobs. But if you believe that the marketplace is in charge of all those functions, as the received wisdom of today assures us, well, then you shouldn't be promising jobs because you are abdicating any responsibility for the complex job-creating mechanisms. Anyway, the marketplace these days is into job elimination. But our crisis isn't simply about jobs. The leader of the free world has 1.5 million people in jail, 373 citizens per 100,000, more than double what it was 15 years ago, a rate second only to Russia, Put another way, 5.1 million Americans are in jail or under judicial supervision. Triple the figures of 1980. The income of 75 million Americans is lower now than it was in 1966. 18% live under the poverty line. The inequality gap shrank continually between 1929 and 1969. Since then, it has been continually widening. And not just in the United States. In most places in the United Kingdom, the gap between the highest and the lowest paid male workers is at its widest since 1880, when the compiling of statistics began. Edward Lutwak, the conservative American historian, says that if current trends continue, the United States will be a third world country by 2020. Predictions are only predictions, but at least Mr. Lutwak is trying to conjure up the shape of the crisis. At least he is admitting that there is a profound crisis. All of these numbers and hundreds more of them referring to the same and to other countries are well known, yet the effect they have on any real policy is negligible. In part, this is because our elite is primarily and increasingly managerial. A managerial elite manages. A crisis, unfortunately, requires thought. Thought is not a management function. Because the managerial elites are now so large and have such a dominant effect on our education system, we are actually teaching most people to manage, not to think. Not only do we not reward thought, we punish it as unprofessional. This primary approach to utility, a very limited form of utility, is creeping now into general pre-university education. The teaching of transient managerial and technological skills is edging out the basics of learning. But there's another reason that knowledge of this crisis seems to have so little effect. The income of the elites at the upper levels has continued to grow and at the middle levels has not declined. As Adam Smith put it, the authority of riches is perhaps greatest in the rudest age of society which admits of any considerable inequality of fortune. By rudest, Smith means crudest, a term not often used to describe themselves by technocrats, specialists, managers, and the professors at the Chicago School of Economics. Yet they do enjoy invoking Smith, nor does rudest suggest a high level of civilization. But what could be cruder than a human being who is touted to a narrow area of knowledge and practice and has the naivete of a child in most other areas? This is one of the elements that accounts for our clinical state of unconsciousness. One of the related characteristic of this unconsciousness is the rise of illusion, in particular, the growth of fantastical descriptions of ourselves. For example, a number of neo-movements have developed over the past few years. People who want to be and yet not to be. The neo-fascists in Italy claim they are not fascists, yet 90% of their party members belong to the old fascist party. I have personally heard their leader, Gio Fini, speak to a crowd of bankers, diplomats and politicians in London. He refused to condemn Mussolini. His policies were simply an updated, managerial-sounding version of Mussolini's, presented by someone who dressed and talked, I'm referring to his own style, like a technocrat. He has said, Italy has gone from an era in which nothing was known of politicians to one where they get photographed naked as if they were actors. This is another sign that Italy has changed. Well, actually, it isn't. 
Mussolini was always photographed as if he were an actor. And behind Mussolini's flamboyant rhetoric was an obsession with modern management and corporatism. Fini dances to rock and roll in public, just as Mussolini prided himself on dancing in public to the latest tunes. These were then innovations in political style. Yet the illusion of being a neo has allowed Fini to escape from the shadow of fascism and gain substantial public power without abandoning his party's traditional policies. The neo-corporatists have the same problem, and even more success. The corporatist movement was born in the 19th century as an alternative to democracy. It proposed the legitimacy of groups over that of the individual citizen. The first almost natural manifestation of this new way of governing came two centuries ago with the arrival of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon did more than invent modern heroic leadership. He invented heroic leadership which fronts for specialist groups and interest groups. Democracy and individual citizen participation were replaced by a direct, emotive relationship between the heroic leader and the population. The new specialist, bureaucratic and business elites were thus left in peace to run things. Hegel was one of the first to give this approach an intellectual form, as early as 1821 in The Philosophy of Right. The romantic revival of the medieval guilds was then underway in the guise of a natural link between civil society and the state. This early form of corporatism gradually emerged as the only serious alternative to democracy. It was increasingly proposed by the Catholic elites of Europe. They could accept the Industrial Revolution so long as individualism was replaced by group membership. To the extent that individualism as citizen participation continued to exist, it was subjected to the limitations imposed by group membership. Many of these groups were apparently benign or even beneficial. Workers unions, industrial owners associations, professional associations. These corporations were not to function in conflict with each other. Through ongoing negotiations, they were to be non-threatening and non-confrontational bodies. Some of this system was formalised by Bismarck in the new Germany of the 1870s. But the corporatist alternative's moment of glory, so to speak, came half a century later under Mussolini and various other dictators, such as Portugal's Salazar. The last thing today's neo-corporatists want is to be confused with these unpleasant dictators. Most of the intellectuals now involved in pushing this social formula are well-established university professors, political scientists, sociologists, and economists spread throughout the West. And yet what they propose, the bald violence of the earlier generation aside, is virtually identical to the earlier model. They propose a basic shifting of legitimacy in our society from the citizen to the group. They don't put it quite that way. They talk modestly about facilitating the relationship between competing interest groups. The effect, however, would be far more profound than that. In fact, I believe that we are already very close to having shifted the legitimacy inside Western society. Real power today lies with neo-corporatism, which is in fact old-fashioned corporatism. The neoconservatives who are closely linked to the neo-corporatists are rather different. They claim to be conservatives when everything they stand for is a rejection of conservatism. They claim to present an alternative social model when they are little more than the courtiers of the corporatist movement. Their agitation is filled with the bitterness and cynicism typical of courtiers who scramble for crumbs at the banquet tables of real power, but are always denied a proper chair. The neo-fascists and neo-corporatists would like people to forget the content of their programs while they seek power. The neoconservatives would like to pass themselves off as a movement of considerable historic importance while working for something relatively short-term, self-interested, and nasty. Everything I've said so far revolves around an apparent inability to deal with reality. I would say that what we suffer from is a fear of reality. Who are we? Frankly, there is little difference in this mental state between those inside the elites and those outside. We have all, by our actions or lack of them, in particular over the last quarter century, agreed to deny reality. The question is, where does this fear come from? It isn't simply a vague taste for romantic illusions. We suffer from an addictive weakness for large illusions, a weakness for ideology. Power in our civilization is repeatedly tied to the pursuit of all-inclusive truths and utopias. At the time of each obsession, we are incapable of recognizing our attitude as either a flight from reality or an embracing of ideology. The unshakable belief that we are on the trail to truth 
and therefore to the solution to our problems, prevents us from identifying this obsession as an ideology. The history of this century, demonstrated in part by its unprecedented violence, suggests that our addiction is getting worse. We have already swept through the religion of world empires based upon the intrinsic superiority of each nation or race of empire builders, on through Marxism and fascism, and now we are enthralled by a new all-powerful clockmaker god, the marketplace, and his archangel, technology. Trade is the marketplace's miraculous cure for all that ails us, and globalization is the Eden or paradise into which the just shall be welcomed on judgment day. As always with ideologies, the day of judgment is imminent and terrifying. I would suggest that Marxism, fascism, and the marketplace strongly resemble each other. They are all corporatist, managerial, and hooked on technology as their own particular golden calf. Along with these great ideological passions, we've also suffered and continue to suffer from what might be called fashions. Nationalization, privatization, debt financing, debt is the devil, the killing of inflation. Fashion is merely the lowest form of ideology. To wear or not to wear blue jeans, to holiday or not to holiday in a particular place, can contribute to social acceptance or bring upon us the full opprobrium of the group. Then, a few months or years later, we look back and our obsession, our fears of ridicule seem a bit silly. By then, we are undoubtedly caught up in new fashions. But the wholesale, unquestioning embrace of political policies does consist of more than wearing blue jeans. Each of these miniature versions will disturb and often ruin many lives. Each will also make the fortune of those who wait patiently to feed off human credulity. Each, in the oppressive air of conformity which ideologies create, will force public figures to conform or be ruined on the scaffold of ridicule. In a society of ideological believers, nothing is more ridiculous than the individual who doubts and does not conform. Think of the truisms of our day. Pay the debt. Embrace globalization. Which public figure of which stripe can stand up against these without committing political suicide? As a result, people like Tony Blair, leader of the British Labour Party, will go out of their way to fall into line. He tells the Financial Times of London, The determining context of economic policy is the new global market. That imposes huge limitations of a practical nature, quite apart from reasons of principle, on macroeconomic policies. These two sentences may sound familiar. They should. They've been uttered in varying forms by hundreds of public figures from the right to the left. Globalization and the limits it imposes are the most fashionable miniature ideologies of our day. Mr. Blair's statement means two things. One, I am in fashion, so it's safe to vote for me. Two, the ideology is in charge, so don't worry. I won't be able to do much. I myself would say that neither of these sentences is in the least bit accurate. They are declarations of passivity before what is said to be inevitable. This is a standard reaction to ideology, and passivity is one of ideology's most depressing effects. The citizen is reduced to the state of the subject, or even of the serf. There is a certain frightening dignity to the big ideologies. With a stroke of an intellectual argument, the planet is put in its place. Terrifying. Only the bravest or the most foolish of individuals would not become passive before such awe-inspiring destinies. The minor ideologies, on the other hand, are almost always mean-spirited and egotistical in the most straightforward way. They offer two choices, no more, and those two are really only one. Accept the ideology or perish. Pay the debt or go bankrupt. Nationalize or starve. Privatize or go moribund. Kill inflation or lose all your money. We have suffered from this either-or sickness for a long time. In the Middle Ages, the scholastics at their worst summarized our choice as order versus disorder. Do what you are told or drop through the black hole. In 1995, the black hole is no longer a specific sin or a question of religious disobedience. But notice that the form of the argument remains religious and that passivity remains an expression of true belief. I've talked about ideology and utopia as if they were one and the same. Is there no difference between them? Not really. Utopia is perhaps more of a literary term, but expresses the real intent of the ideologue. Of course, no ideologue would be caught dead admitting to a utopian ideal. That would imply hope when what he is delivering is truth. He doesn't even see himself as an ideologue. But why do we have this desperate need to believe that the solving of a single problem will solve all our problems? Or that a particular and absolute form of social organization will bring history to an end? 
The need to fabulate, the French novelist Romain Gary said, is just a child who refuses to grow up. Yet there is no innocent childish charm hidden within our need to fabulate. None, for example, in Professor Fukuyama's declaration that his side had won and therefore we had come to the end of history. Rather, there was an unpleasant air of self-serving propaganda. Fabulation in all of us suggests a fear of reality, a weakness for ideology, a need to believe in single-stroke cure-all solutions, a taste for the intolerance of conformity when we come to public policy, all of which translates into a debilitating passivity when faced by crises. This suggests that we have difficulty perceiving our own weaknesses. Let me put this another way. If we are unable to identify reality and therefore unable to act upon what we see, then we are not simply childish, but have reduced ourselves to figures of fun, ridiculous victims of our unconscious. The conscious human holds happily onto a sense of his own ridiculousness. Unfortunately, our sense of the ridiculous in ourselves seems to ebb and flow, but to remain dangerously weak when it comes to public affairs. And the weaker it is, the more we tend to slip into an unhealthy, unconscious form of self-contempt. Worse still, we cultivate this loathing in our elites. We encourage them to think of us, the citizenry, with contempt, and so to think of themselves in the same way. If we cannot see ourselves, then we cannot act as humans. It is hardly surprising that the result is a loss of self-respect. This self-loathing is key to our weakness for ideology. Those who have the truth are by definition a small minority. They are the elect. Their desire is not to convince the rest of us of their truth. It isn't a matter of democratic debate with all the compromise that involves. They have the truth. The aim of the ideologue is therefore to manipulate, trick or force the majority into acceptance. People whom you intend to manipulate, trick or force are people for whom you have contempt. And if they, the majority, allow themselves to be taken in, well then, they do have contempt for themselves. The modern version of this process first appeared during the Reformation on both sides of the debate. The Protestants, who accepted predestination, attempted a profoundly passive existence for themselves. It is true that spreading the word was important, but good works would get them nowhere. God had already chosen who would be saved. Everyone had but to wait for death to find out their ultimate destination. If, however, a small group could somehow convince itself that it knew the mind of God and that its members were the chosen few, the elect, well then, they could throw off their passivity and drive the condemned majority before them. All and any methods were justified because the elect alone held the truth. This was also the mentality of Ignatius Loyola and his Jesuits who picked up the Protestant methods, thus adding a firm rational structure to Catholicism. Their intent was to give shape and weaponry to the Counter-Reformation. Here was the beginning of modern ideology and absolutism. The Jacobins of the French Revolution, the Bolsheviks, the Fascists, and now the Free Marketeers are all the direct descendants of predestination and the Jesuits. They are the chosen few, the minority who have the truth and therefore have the right to impose it by whatever means. Am I really being fair, throwing in among such a violent, bloody crew the market disciples with their Chicago School of Economics bona fides and their endless Nobel Prizes to say nothing of the neoconservatives who are in general wonderfully educated? Listen to Michael Oakeshott, the English professor, now dead, who is one of the father figures of the neoconservatives. Politics, he said, is vulgar, bogus, callous, because of the sort of people it attracts and because of the false simplification of human life implied in even the best of its purposes. Politics, he believes, should be left in the hands of men from the traditional political families, not some democratic, ambitious person. This same loathing for the majority can be found in the political philosopher Leo Strauss, who gave birth, in a sense, to Alan Bloom, who in turn, with great intelligence and style, demonstrated to the American public via his book The Closing of the American Mind that most of them were of an inferior nature. Intellectuals here and there followed suit. Otho Strauss, the well-known German playwright, wrote a trend-setting article in 1993 for Der Spiegel along somewhat the same lines. He wrote it in a high literary German, incomprehensible to the majority of readers. Yet this elitism somehow inspired the rising groups of violent skinheads in Germany. Here is a vibrant example of self-hatred. The skinheads were inspired by an argument which, in its very form, denigrated them. A little bevy of youngish Americans, mainly the sons of either rich or well-established families, has constituted itself as the North American branch of this movement. These are the eager courtiers of neoconservatism. 
The atmosphere which reigns in their language is one of an embattled minority elite seeking ways to manoeuvre, manipulate and fool the majority into passive acceptance. In a recent public conversation, they could be heard saying such things as, we can't really go to poor black people and throw them off welfare if we haven't first gone to rich white farmers and thrown them off welfare. And the big programs like welfare, Medicaid and Medicare will take a little time to get rid of. But there are a lot of little ones that we can get rid of right away. And it's dangerous for the party to seem callous. Note the word seem. On the other hand, in the current environment, being accused of callousness might even seem to be our advantage. Their air of cynical bitterness, in spite of their own comfortable situations, also suggests an unconsciousness of their own profound self-loathing. The tone throughout is one of religious sadomasochism. We have done wrong. We have had it easy. We indebted ourselves. Now we must pay. We must don hair shirts. We must impose suffering upon ourselves. Of course, the suffering will fall on others, but that is beside the point. The Italians have a wonderful word to describe a mummy's boy. Un mamoni. When I hear or read these people, I can't help thinking of a daddy's boy, un paponi, someone who tries to be as tough as or tougher than his father. In any case, their approach is pure reformation, politico-religious rhetoric. And like those church leaders 400 years ago, the new variety must, as the Canadian writer M.T. Kelly puts it, create the other, the devil. This demonization is also essential to deny any goodness or moral value to the other side. In fairness to the courtier tradition, it is important to add that by no means all of them have been, like the neoconservatives, bitter and cynical. History has been full of men and women who had to sing one tune or another for their supper. Often they had no choice if they wanted to play a public role. They were victims of the reigning social structure. Our society today is very much like that. The highly educated, technocratic, specialised elites who make up more than a third of our population are caught in structures which require of them courtier-like behaviour. Today, as in history, their ranks are filled with people who try their best. They put up with the indignity of their role in order to eat. Yes, we must all eat, but also in order to serve a good cause. On the other hand, history also records a group of courtiers who have taken pleasure in the humiliation which their status demands. Often they were successful precisely because their self-loathing and cynicism allowed them to make the most of a situation that rewarded crude ambition and manipulation. Shakespeare was particularly good at portraying the two types of courtiers side by side, inner strength versus weakness, an ethical center versus vain ambition, a sense of the public good versus a wounded sense of having been personally wronged. Kent versus Edmund in King Lear, Rodrigo versus Iago in Othello. The Iagos and Edmunds of our day are by no means limited to the ranks of neoconservatism. As we gaze around at ministers' offices, at departmental administrations, at corporate executive suites, we can see courtiers of all sorts making their way. But the neoconservative courtiers do appear to fall almost as a group into this category. Given that they are of age and legally responsible for their actions, this must be treated by society as a matter of their own choice. Let me widen the focus here by briefly reintroducing the subject of corporatism. First, corporatists from the 1870s on began laying in the idea that liberalism was guilty of a great sin because it had granted political and economic equality to individuals who were manifestly unequal. In other words, the corporatists were reviving the medieval hierarchical order. Late in the century, the German, Max Weber, and the Frenchman, Emil Durkheim, gave corporatism a sophisticated intellectual shape. There were arguments over whether such a system should be state-centred or economic-centred or society-centred. But the only important point is that it was group-centred and interest-centred. The value of disinterest, that is, the disinterested act or the public good, was denied and ignored. The very idea of the public good was therefore vaporised. In 1891, a papal encyclical, Rerum Novarum, came out against class structure and proposed a modern version of the medieval scholastic dream of the perfect social order. This appeared to be a rejection of Marxist conflict in favour of social harmony. In reality, it was a rejection of humanism, democracy and responsible individualism in favour of administrative power sharing by interest groups. After the First World War, men like Mihail Manolesco 
and Alfredo Rocco took those ideas further and prepared the anti-parliamentarian atmosphere which led to a series of coup d'etats and dictatorships in the 1920s and 30s. With the arrival of Mussolini and a bevy of other dictators, corporatism found itself at the centre of modern power for the first time. The underlying messages of Mussolini's system were efficiency, professionalism, management by experts, social order through ongoing group negotiations, or what the neo-corporatists now call interest mediation. And all of this was to take place in a society balanced by heroic leadership and market forces. Contemporary corporatism has a more professional approach, and yet it is focused in an eerily familiar manner on training, meritocracy, and organizational structures, which are inevitably pyramidal. In other words, the intent is exactly the same. This message is put out in a rhetorical, ideological manner through corporatism's mouthpieces. The disciples of market forces, the courtiers of neoconservatism, and, of particular importance, the authoritative voice of many social science academics. Second, the denigration of such democratic, individualistic concepts as equality and justice has required from the very beginnings of corporatism a new set of social headings to put up over every doorway. This new approach was best evoked by Marischal Pétain, the leader of collaborationist, corporatist France during World War II. His slogan replaced liberté, égalité, fraternité with patrie, famille, travail, nation, or rather fatherland, family, work. Other fascist, corporatist governments produce similar slogans. Now, if you take a look at Newt Gingrich's list of seven essential personal strengths for Americans, you will discover that work is at the top of the list. Family takes up four self-righteous variations on that theme in the middle, and at the bottom is an even more self-righteous version of nation. Six out of seven comes pretty close. For that matter, three of his five principles of an American civilization deal with business, technology, and organization all characteristics of work. There is no mention of liberty or equality or, for that matter, of democracy. And that is because Gingrich is a fairly typical example of a corporatist who is disguised, at least in part unconsciously, behind the rhetoric of crude, that is to say false, individualism, and false modernism. But the arguments which will follow in these pages are not simply focused on our Western weakness for ideology or on our inability to recognize ideology as such when we are in its grip, or on our resulting acceptance of a passivity that irritates us until we seek demons on the other side or a new ideology. We cannot see the shapes of our own reality. And this might help us to be less easily made prisoner of the great inapplicable questions of what is civilization, what is man? Ideologies always have the all-inclusive answer to these impossible questions. They phrase them a little differently, however with the aggressiveness of assertion. What should civilization be? They know. What is man? Meaning, what he is leaves him with no choice. Freed from these assertions, we could fall back on more reasonable questions. What could civilization be? In practical terms, that is. What can humans realistically achieve and maintain for reasonable periods of time? What I am suggesting may sound extremely simple, so simple as to be naive. I would remind you, however, that Socrates was executed not for saying what things were or should be, but for seeking practical indications of where some reasonable approximation of truth might be. He was executed not for his megalomania or grandiose propositions or certitudes, but for stubbornly doubting the absolute truths of others. Let me slide the focus still wider. If I wanted to know what kind of society I was living in, I would begin by asking, where does legitimacy lie? After all, the source of legitimacy is at the very heart of civilization. From that assumption about ultimate authority flows much of the rest. Power, organization, attitudes both private and public, ethics admired or condemned or ignored. I can identify only four real options in Western history as the source's legitimacy. God, a king, groups, or the individual citizenry acting as a whole. There are many variations on these sources. Many kings have claimed direct inspiration from God and so combined the two. Modern dictators, from Napoleon on through Hitler, have claimed to inherit the legitimacy of a king. The groups have ranged from medieval guilds to modern corporatism. Now, the peculiarity of the first three sources, God, King and the groups, is that, once in power, they automatically set about reducing the fourth, the individual, to a state of passivity. The individual citizen is reduced to the state of a subject. 
that is, he is subjected to the will of one or more of these other legitimacies. In other words, gods, kings, and groups are not compatible with the fourth source because they require acquiescence, while individualism requires participation. Either one or more of the first three is in a dominant position or the fourth dominates. I would argue that our society functions today largely on the relationship between groups. What do I mean by groups? Some of us immediately conjure up transnational corporations. Others think of government ministries. But this is to miss the point. There are thousands of hierarchically or pyramidally organized interest and specialist groups in our society. Some are actual businesses, some are groupings of businesses, some are professions or narrow categories of intellectuals. Some are public, some private, some well-intentioned, some ill-intentioned. Doctors, lawyers, sociologists, a myriad of scientific groups. The point is not who or what they are. The point is that society is seen as a sum of all the groups, nothing more and that the primary loyalty of the individual is not to the society, but to her group. Serious, important decisions are made not through democratic discussion or participation, but through negotiation between the relevant groups based upon expertise, interest, and the ability to exercise power. I would argue that the Western individual, from the top to the bottom of what is now defined as the elite, acts first as a group member. As a result, they, we exist primarily as a function, not as a citizen, not as an individual. We are rewarded in our hierarchical meritocracies for our success as an integrated function. We know that real expressions of individualism are not only discouraged, but punished. The active, outspoken citizen is unlikely to have a successful professional career. What I am describing is the essence of corporatism. Forget the various declared intentions of the successive generations of corporatists, from the old Catholic groups to the fascists, to the spokesmen for pyramidal technocratic organizations, to the well-intentioned neo-corporatist social scientists of today. What counts is what they have in common, and that is their assumption as to where legitimacy lies. In corporatism, it lies within the group, not the citizen. The human is thus reduced to a measurable value, like a machine or a piece of property. We can choose to achieve a high value and live comfortably, or be dumped unceremoniously onto the heap of marginality. To be precise, we live in a corporatist society with soft pretensions to democracy. More power is slipping every day over towards the groups. That is the meaning of the marketplace ideology and of our passive acceptance of whatever form globalization happens to take. Our only serious reactions to this phenomenon have come in the form of angry populism, which I will argue later is largely false populism, focused on such anti-democratic mechanisms as referenda and what is called direct democracy. For the moment, I would like to expand on the particularity of gods, kings, and groups. They cannot function happily within a real democracy, that is, within a society of individuals. They are systems devoid of what I would call disinterest. Their actions are based entirely upon the idea of interest. They are self-destructive because they cannot take seriously the long-term or the wider view, both of which are dependent on a measure of disinterest, which could also be called the public good or the common well. The society in which legitimacy lies with the individual citizen is quite different. It can happily tolerate gods, kings, and groups, providing they do not interfere with the public good, that is, providing that they are properly regulated by the standards of the public good. The citizen-based society can do this because it is built upon the shared disinterest of the individuals. What's more, this has a tempering effect, which can actually be beneficial to the other three forces, the gods, kings, and groups. It limits their self-destructive nature by focusing them onto the larger term and wider picture. I believe that our ability to reassert the citizen-based society is dependent upon the simple concepts of disinterest and participation. Both of these are a protection against our seemingly unconscious desire to take refuge in ideology. But the policies now being put in place throughout the West are based upon exactly the opposite assumption. Everything, from school education to public services, is being restructured on the self-destructive basis of self-interest. I spoke earlier of three parallel oppositions or struggles. Humanism versus ideology, balance versus imbalance, equilibrium versus disequilibrium. I can now add two more, democratic individualism versus corporatism, the citizen versus the subject. In the next chapter, I'll deal with language versus propaganda and consciousness versus unconsciousness.
At this stage of our civilization, late in the 20th century, I would say that we are losing each of these struggles to the darker side within us and within our society. Am I exaggerating? Are we truly living in a corporatist society that uses democracy as little more than a pressure release valve? Clearly, the democratic mechanisms are still in place, and the citizens do occasionally succeed in imposing a direction upon the elites. But then I am not making an absolutist argument. What I'm talking about is the direction our society has taken and how far it has gone along that path. A simple test of our situation would involve examining the health of the public good. For example, there has never been so much money, actual money, disposable cash, in circulation as there is today. I am measuring this quantity both in absolute terms and on a per capita basis. Look at the growth of the banking industry and the even more explosive growth of the money markets. There has never been so much disposable money, yet there is no money for the public good. In a democracy, this would not be the case, because the society would be centred by general agreement on disinterest. In a corporatist system, there is never any money for the public good, because the society is reduced to the sum of the interests. It is therefore limited to measurable self-interest. What then is the great leap backwards announced in the title of this chapter? It is our leap into the unconscious state beloved of the subject who, existing as a function in any one of the tens of thousands of corporations, public and private, is relieved of personal, disinterested responsibility for his society. He thus gives in to the easy temptation of embracing what I can only call the passive certitude offered by every ideology. Let me close with two final oppositions. The first is that of permanent human patterns versus the temporary. Most of what is presented to us today as the inevitable forms of human relationships, given the dictates of such things as the market and technology, are in reality rather recent phenomena of a temporary, even incidental nature. These are passing relationships because they are directly dependent upon the evolving forms of crude power. To develop theories about human nature and the nature of human society based upon temporary variations of this sort of power, as we have often done from Adam Smith on through Marx, is to waste a lot of time on the service roads of economics. These phenomena can be seen in their truly ephemeral nature when compared to the essential propositions which have been with us virtually unchanged for 2,500 years, Solon's ideas of public justice, Socrates' view of the citizen's role as a persistent annoyance, Cicero's The Good of the People is the Chief Law, John of Salisbury's Who is More Contemptible Than He Who Scorns Knowledge of Himself. There are thousands of other examples, in language and in action, of our efforts to improve ourselves by developing a responsible sense of self and society. There is also a record of the ephemeral phenomena of self-interest. The trail is equally long. Personal gain, violence for personal advancement, clever manipulation to get and hold power, the political figures who use their power for narrow purposes are often remembered, but generally as unfortunate examples of human weakness. The interesting thing is that nowhere in our active memory is this record of selfish acts in fact admired. It stands rather as a record of our failures. This leads me to a final opposition. You might believe from the negative nature of my comments on us, the human, that I myself am one of those who looks down contemptuously from the advantaged position of the elite and who therefore also suffers unconsciously from self-loathing. But the confronting of reality usually is a negative process. It is ideology that insists upon relentless positivism. That's why it opposes criticism and encourages passivity. I would argue that confronting reality, no matter how negative and depressing the process, is the first step towards coming to terms with it, which is what I will attempt to do in a small way over the next four chapters. This evening I have simply been exercising my right as a citizen, my Socratic right, to criticise, to reject conformity, passivity and inevitability. What encourages me in this process is the delight that I take in the human struggle. Delight in mankind. That was the idea launched, or rather relaunched, in the 12th century by the forces of humanism as they woke society from its dark ages. The Roman poet, Terence, had said long before, I am human and nothing human is foreign to me. It was an attitude the humanists embrace in what they saw as a struggle between delight and self-loathing. Delight in your fellow man and woman, sympathy for them, in other words, a sense of society. This was then, as it is now, a profoundly anti-ideological idea which takes the human for what the human is and believes it is worth trying to do better.